reading about in your newspaper and watching on uh, television the last week or so, and we give you our interpretation of what these stories are all about. We put our spin on it. We, we try to go behind the story to tell you what, what's really happening in regard to what the story is talking about. And our program is rebroadcast on Wednesday night from 11 to 12. So if you're up late and you want something to do and you're tired of watching the news, you can tune us in uh, if you miss us on Tuesday night tonight. And also, uh, we're on uh, flinttalk.com. 24 hours a day, so you can tune in there if you miss us on Tuesday night and you can't watch on Wednesday night. Uh, you can pick it up if you have a, you know, with your computer on uh, flinttalk.com. We have a number of stories we want to talk to you about tonight. Um, you know, they're from all over the county, from the township of Vienna and Clyle, the city of Clyle, to the city of Burton from the city of Flint to the township of Flint, from the Flint board, school board uh, to the crazy politics of the Genesee County Commission. And you see all these stories affect and impact all of our lives, wherever we live and work. Now a good example of this impact concerns the crime crackdown in the city of Flint that was just announced this past weekend. I'm sure many of you read about it and watch it on television. Uh, you know, over 100 criminals, and of course today's paper indicates over 120 criminals were arrested and taken out of uh, circulation. Was it theatrics? Or was it a highly synchronized police job? You know, we'll examine that issue in this hour. And we'll look at the newest power grab by the Burton Mayor Charles Smiley and his stooges on the Burton City Council by appointing some of his already discredited political friends to new positions in Burton of influence. How can this be happening? And we'll also examine the question of whether the $80 million that have been put aside or will be put aside for the county senior citizens, the millage, and is this, this millage going to be used and put on what we call the fast track to oblivion? Shouldn't there be a plan of action before money is doled out haphazardly to self-serving organizations like the 15 or 20 uh, senior citizens already existing in the county. Uh, actually, it's probably 15 to 16 or 17 of them. Apparently, political pressure is the measuring stick and how the money is being allocated with no strings attached. No coordination it's a waste of resources. So we'll talk about that too. Likewise, we want to look at the major drug bust conducted just this last week by the Genesee County Sheriff's Department, assisted by the city police, the Genesee Township Police, and maybe other police departments. And then we'll tell you where the newest speed trap has been set up in the county and how to avoid getting caught up in it. We have this information and no one else has it, so we'll tell you about it. And then we'll have some closing thoughts on the ignominious dispatching of the Clyle superintendent of schools. And we have to ask, will it stand up to legal scrutiny? And these and others as, as time permits. Now, you know, this past week, the Flint Police Department made a major effort to crack down on crime in the city of Flint. It started with a press conference at City Hall this last Thursday or Friday, where the crackdown 
was to be announced. Now here's Channel 12 story on the action that was to be taken according to the press conference. Can you play that please? ABC 12's Kathy Schaffer joining us now live from police headquarters in Flint with more on this developing story. Kathy? Bill, the city jail or the city lockup as some call it is located up there on the second floor of Flint Police Headquarters. It's been closed on and off for, uh, because of budget issues since the late 70s. Back in 2000 though was the last time funds were found to reopen it. Today though, Flint's mayor Don Williamson gathered reporters together to announce that the new city run impound lot had produced enough money, about a million dollars or more, to be able to open the jail. With the money, he says, they'll be hiring 21 new guards and seven supervisors to open it by this May. So would the opening of the jail earlier have prevented Flint's most recent crime spree, like the four homicides in the city of Flint last weekend? The police chief says that's really too hard to say, but he says it will help with many crimes, like drug-related crimes that often lead to more violent crimes. Ladies of the evening. Most of them don't choose that profession because it's such a fantastic profession. They choose that profession because somebody got them hooked on drugs and they got themselves hooked on drugs. If I can't ever get them into jail, then I can't get them before a judge that can get them into programs that can take them out of the vicious cycle they're stuck in. So yes, it will have an impact on drug trafficking. It will have an impact on many things in our community. There were, by the way, two more elements to the crime-fighting plan announced by the mayor and the police chief today. One of those is a gun buyback program, and details of that will be announced closer to the details of the program that starts in April. There will also be a bounty program where residents of the city can call 911 and receive $100 if they turn in somebody who has an illegal weapon in the city of Flint. The money for that $60,000 being donated by the mayor's wife, Patsy Lee Williamson, from her dealership. Reporting live from police headquarters, Kathy Schaffron, ABC 12 News. Now, you know, anybody can get up there and talk about what they plan on doing, and it sounds good. And politicians have a habit of doing that because they're only telling you the good things about themselves. The question is whether or not what is said has any action, any power or influence to make something happen or what they're talking about. And of course, uh, you know, a press conference can be called, you know, very simply in 15 minutes and make statements that sound good, but what happens after that? Is anything done? So we have uh, this question being raised by many of the mayor's opponents and, and the police uh, department's opponents. So the question is, is it just a lot of talk? Well, the interesting thing is that after this press conference, and I'm sure the mayor was aware of this, there's this major crackdown on crime in the city of Flint. So the next question is, was that part of the theatrics of a press con conference announcing what you're going to do than actually doing it? We'll examine that right now, but let's play that tape from uh, what happened the following day or two from the mayor's press conference. Uh, play that, will you please? Street violence in the city of Flint. Over the weekend, the city jail was temporarily opened. In a two day period, more than 100 people were arrested and booked. ABC Charles Matt Franklin is live in downtown Flint now with more. Matt? Angie, the acting Flint police chief, says that these people were picked up for suspicious activity and brought here to the city jail on various charges. Many of them either took care of their legal issues right then and there or ended up over at the county jail. Now, acting police chief Gary Hagler says the jail will be open periodically until enough staff is hired to keep it open 24-7. 21 jail guards and seven supervisors are needed by the May 21st opening. The city jail will be funded by dollars from the new city-run impound lot. Plans to reopen the jail have been in the works for some time, but kicked into high gear following four murders in the city just a few weeks ago. Hagler says Flint is long overdue to have its own jail facilities, but will continue to open the jail on occasion until all the staff has been hired and maintenance issues are fixed. It may be sometimes during the week. 
It may be sometimes on the weekend. And we're going to fluctuate this so, one, they get the message. They never know when it's going to be open. And encourage them right now, get down and take care of your old warrants so that you don't end up spending the weekend in jail. Opening, this, opening the city jail is the first step in Flint Mayor Don Williams' safety emergency plan announced last week. The other steps include a gun buyback program and an armed criminal bounty program, which offers a reward to anyone who helps police arrest someone illegally carrying a weapon on the streets of Flint. In the meantime, the acting police chief is calling the temporary opening of the city jail this past weekend a success. We're live at Flint Police Headquarters. Matt Franklin, ABC 12 News. Well, you know... Um that's pretty significant. Uh, he makes a statement, uh, you know, and anybody can make a statement. They can put it together in 10, 15 minutes, call the press in, they're there in 15 or 20 minutes, and you have a press conference. So it's a lot of words. But the follow-up the next day and the next two days of arresting, you know, over 100 people on various charges, including felonies, that's, uh, the action speaks louder than the words. So the question is, was this all theatrics? Now we acknowledge that the press conference could very well be just theatrics, but the follow-up, could that be theatrics too? The, the uh, naysayers, uh, of Williamson and the police department say the, these actions were all reactions to the four murders committed last weekend. Now, we have to examine that issue to find out whether or not all this was done and all this was said in good faith. The, the, the important thing here is can a can these raids and these arrests be put together in a few minutes? Because the, the the murders occurred what a week, a week and a half ago. Can they be put together to make all these arrests simultaneously? Now, you know, over the years I've, as a prosecutor, I was in the prosecutor's office 23 years, I've participated in these crackdowns. And coordination is essential. You, you, uh, you can't put it, as I say, together in 15 minutes. It's, it's more planning and coordination that is needed here. For example, you have to, f first, you go out there with warrants, you have to know who they are. A lot of paperwork getting that ready. Then you have to identify these guys, these culprits, these suspects. You know, there's over 121 of them that have been arrested so far. And that takes a lot of time. And then before you make, go out to make the arrest, you have to have some idea where they are. If you arrest 121, you must have had some idea. So often it takes time to do surveillances before you go out to find out where these people are on certain days and certain nights, on certain hours even. So when you make the raid, you're going to catch them. Because if you don't, the word will get on the streets that these this crackdown is occurring, and criminals who know they haven't appeared in court on the date they're supposed to, or, or whatever, there's warrants for them, and they know about it, but they haven't been arrested yet, they know they're on the list, and they're getting out of town. So all of this has to be done kind of all together, everything time so that the arrests are made just about the same time all over the city or all over the county. Because people will run away if you don't. And then, you know, another coordinating imperative in this, you know, is the police officers. You don't have to have a, a large number of them to arrest 121 people. 
they, a large number would need to conduct the raid and make the arrests, obviously. They can't send five guys out and just go around knocking on doors looking for these people. Coordination is essential. You know, uh, cops would have to be assigned to locations and suspects. I mean, we had these raids in the past where the police were all gathered together in a uh, squad room and they sit there until we make the move or ready to make the move on the arrests and they're handed the warrants at that time and they're told to go out at that time and make the arrests and here's where the people are or should be and here are their associates, look for them. All of that's planned, that's prepared. And it isn't done in an hour or two hours or even a week. Sometimes it takes months. And here we have all this coordination with the number of people arrested. There must have been a lot of work in preparation and coordination for this, to arrest this many people and to bring them in within a day or two days. They had to know where they were. They had to have done preliminary work on this beforehand. And then having the jail available to take the prisoners needed planning. You couldn't take 121 guys or girls or women or whatever it was over to the county jail and drop them off. He doesn't, the sheriff doesn't have the room. So you had to arrange so that the city jail would be available, which it was on this particular occasion. So there had to be planning and coordination there. There had to be enough money to open the jail. And you know, it's interesting that the mayor has come up with this idea of using money or, or establishing an impound lot and using money that is gathered by auctioning these cars off if they're not picked up, selling the parts of cars that aren't picked up, uh, the, the cost of, of uh, being in the impound or getting the, the car out of the impound. In the past, all that money was going to the people who were picking up the vehicles, the record companies, and taking them to their own impound lots. Now, according to the mayor, and again, I'm sure the council will look at this, so far they've collected a million dollars to use to open the city jail. That's, that is a very unique approach. I don't know of any other city in the country that's doing this. And you know, and I, I look at the other townships and cities in the county that are impounding cars or they have record companies impounding cars and taking those cars to the impound lot and they make all the money off the cars. This is what was happening in the city of Flint till the mayor decided he'd do it his way which would be the city owns the impound lot and the city sells the cars at auction and and whatever profits to be made, it goes to the city. You know, all these other communities that do this, you know, they might think of some way of hooking up with the city of Flint on the impound and working a deal out where they get some of the money back that Flint would be able to make off their impounds. That's better than getting nothing. They don't get anything now but just big contributions to the politicians who assign these record companies to do this work. Now, they do make money with these contributions. Now, another thing that would indicate, another factor that would indicate that this raid was well coordinated, was planned in advance, was that the crackdown was coordinated with the state police fugitive squad. Another example was done the spur of the moment, moment for, for political reasons, although politics comes into it because people want this done and therefore it helps you politically if you're the mayor of the city of Flint. 
Now, uh, of course, when the state police get their fugitive squad involved in these actions, they take time to get it right. They're very conscientious to keep mistakes at a minimum. So there must have been time working with the state police fugitive squad and putting this together. I would say, as I indicated, that these raids and these arrests have been in the mail for at least two months, probably, getting ready for this thing. You know, keep in mind that also the city police at the time these, this bus went down were also investigating four murders that happened a couple of weekends ago that have generated a lot of concern in the community. Uh, there's been one arrest on those, uh, on those four murders so far. And then we had one Saturday where a man coming out of Merrill School uh, uh, on a Saturday morning with his two children, they were there participating in some kind of a family program, was shot and killed right in front of his kids. Three people have been arrested on that. So the question is, you know, what can you do to crack down on crime in any community, especially urban communities like Flint? You know, often when you look at the statistics, murders are committed between family members, and friends, and neighbors. You know, often you can't control that because you can't anticipate it. But there are some kinds of crimes of violence, like murders, that you can do something about. And in this day and age, it has to do with cracking down on narcotic distribution. And that's where you can impact violent crime because a lot of violence is occurring because of drugs. And we don't know yet whether these four murders two weekends ago and the one this past Saturday had anything to do with drugs. But I'm betting it did. Maybe not all of them, but most of them. If, if you've got people being shot and killed and there is no relationship that is known between the parties. Invariably, those are drug-related murders. So you have, to, you have to crack down on that. And, and then also the city police at this time were involved in a big narcotics bust announced this past Friday by uh, Sheriff Bob Piquel. So all of these things were going on at the time that these raids and these arrests were made this past weekend. So there is a lot of action. There is a lot of things happening. And I don't think it was done in the spur of the moment, obviously, and it wasn't a political act, other than the fact you gain politically by doing your job. So I think the mayor has done himself some good politically, but more importantly, he's done the, uh, done the city of Flint a lot of good by giving them additional protection, taking these people off the streets. But, as I said, he's got to do something about the narcotic problem. He's got to be very conscientious about raiding those drug houses, putting those people in jail, and get them out of, getting them out of circulation. Bob Piquel, uh Sheriff's Department, has a, a, an organization called the Posse, who apparently is doing really a remarkable job in dealing with the harder drugs, the, the cocaine, the heroin, things like that. These are the people that are really involved in the murders and the violent attacks on people in most cases. And you can understand why when you see this next cut. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars involved in drug trafficking in Flint, Michigan. So killing someone to, to protect the money that you're making on drugs 
really becomes an insignific insignificant thing to people like this, to the drug dealers. So you have to you have to begin to move in on these kinds of people, and you will have a, an impact on murders and and violent crimes because a lot of it is coming from these people. In fact, I'd say most of them in which the parties aren't related like family and friends and neighbors and things like that, where you usually have the person that's done it right there when you show up and arrests are made immediately. These kinds of murders that we have saw on the weekend before and this past uh, weekend on Saturday morning, where you don't have any known relationship with the parties, invariably are drug related. But here's this sheriff who has this posse and has done remarkable things with it. And here's the latest. Can you play that tape, please? Tonight, 33-year-old Deshaun Howard of Flint Township and 42-year-old Jorge Veramontes are suspected of running the criminal drug enterprise in the Saturday night drug raid of a house on Sloan Street in Flint. The sheriff's drug posse recovered more than a half a million dollars in cash in stacks of 20s, 50s, and $100 bills and 10 kilos of cocaine. This is why we have a lot of murders and a lot of violence in the city of Flint and Genesee County. It's called drugs, crack, cocaine. The two suspects are in the Genesee County Jail. They are expected to appear in federal court tomorrow. A federal department isn't the only one hard at work. Just last week, the Genesee County Drug Posse made the largest drug and cash bust in the county's history. Today, ABC 12's John Jones sat down with the sheriff to discuss where the money goes after the bust. She joins us now from Flint which, with much more on this story. And Don, how much money did they recover in the last bust? Well, Taryn, it was more than a half a million dollars in cash, and Sheriff Bacall says the drug posse will get a large chunk of that money, but not all of it. There it was, laid out for the media, stacks of cash and hundreds, fifties, and twenty dollar bills. We counted it, and it's uh, six hundred and forty-four thousand eight hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars. And another two million dollars in drugs, all of it taken by the Genesee County Drug Posse from one drug dealer in the city of Flint. It's just one major dealer. There's many more like that out there. And so you, know, you can see that the problem is very, very pervasive. When the drug posse takes down a dealer, Sheriff Pakel says the department gets a cut of the cash, a pretty big cut from this latest bust. Uh, the sheriff's posse will get about 312000 of it. And then we have to divvy the money up among the other police agencies that worked on it. Sheriff Pakel says the 300 plus thousand dollars will be put back into the posse. And it only can be used to enhance drug investigations, so the money will go back in to fight other drug dealers, and that's what we'll use it for. And the sheriff tells us that it's a fight that becomes more challenging every day, but he says the drug posse is committed to bringing down mid-level and high-end drug dealers in the city, one bust at a time. For now, we're live in Flint, Don Jones, ABC 12 News. I think what's important here is, uh, besides taking these people off the streets and making the point that this is one of the serious problems still in Genesee County and in Flint, Michigan, that uh, this money that they've confiscated, uh, will, much of it, over $300,000, will be used to fund the, f the sheriff's posse's uh, organization. And by doing that, you know, having more money to make buys, uh, probably hiring more police officers because the counties uh, will be given this money and it will go into the fund on behalf of the sheriff's department. So they can hire more people to do more uh, things like this. And I think that that's uh, an important aspect of this whole thing. But uh, in the end, it's, uh, you know, it's conscientious commitment to doing something about this problem. And obviously the sheriff has done that and hopefully uh, we'll see some evidence of that uh, from the, uh, uh, the uh, city police. Uh, they were involved in this obviously. They 
uh, they participated in the investigation, they participated in the arrests and the raid. So uh, they and other departments like Genesee Township uh, uh, were called in to assist and, and did very well. And they'll all end up with some of the money, but the Sheriff's Department was the main source on this investigation and obviously will end up with the biggest chunk. You know, I've been around law enforcement for the last 50 years, and, and this, without a doubt, is the biggest narcotic bust I, I can ever remember. So the sheriff and his people, uh, and, and also the Flint Police and the Genesee Township Police and the other police agency that participated uh, deserve uh, a lot of credit. And, and so we come down to the bottom line here. These raids in the city of Flint by the Flint Police Department, by the Sheriff's Department, by the other police agencies that participated, uh, they were done as a, they weren't done as a, a spare of the moment thing. It was, all of these were well co coordinated police work that took time to put together. And that was the reason for the success of the entire operations. So, while these press conferences can be called and uh, are always suspicious, uh, when things happen after the press conference that was promised in the press conference, uh, they become very significant and as a result, uh, it takes the onus off the back of the person conducting the press conference. There's a lot, a long way to go in Flint to deal with some of the problems we have. Hopefully this is just the start of it, to start to deal and to eliminate these problems. Now tonight we also want to talk about the, really the travesty in government that is taking place in the, the city of Burton. Remember that in 2005 the city council election, and at the city council election in Burton, the voters of the Burton city government, when they elected, they, what they did is they elected two anti-Smiley council candidates to the Burton city council. And this gave the anti-Smiley uh, people a slim four to three majority on the council for the first time since Smiley was elected mayor some 15, 16, 17 years ago. Unfortunately, in the last year and a half, two vacancies occurred. One person moved from the city of Burton, and another was elected to the Genesee County Commission. As a result, Smiley co Smiley's cohort, still on the council, appointed one of Smiley's supporters, Major, uh, Jeff Majors. He worked for Smiley as the public works director for a number of years. And then they tried to appoint another person by the name of Ralph Duke, another retired public works director. Now the second appointment presently hangs in limbo because LeDuke didn't get the required four votes necessary from the council for the appointment. The charter requires it. And if you can believe this, the city attorney rules that you couldn't be appointed to the city council by the, four, uh, the needed four votes because he didn't have them. But since he, listen this, since he was sworn in by mistake by the city clerk, who happens to be a smiley appointee, he could serve as if he was legally appointed, voting on all issues. You know, we all, uh, people all agree out there that, that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't appointed legally. But what has happened is this uh, screw re, uh, ruling by the city attorney who worked for a lot, 10, 11 years with Smiley as an assistant city attorney. The Duke has become the deciding fourth vote with the Smiley Council flunkies led by City Council President Gary Eichen. Now another thing that's interesting, you might remember 
The Duke ran for the city council in the last council election in 205 and was soundly defeated by the anti-Smiley candidates. He came in second to last. Notwithstanding, Isham and Smiley's people on the council thumbed their nose at the Burton City voters and tried to appoint the candidate, uh, the candidate with Duke, who they clearly rejected in 205. Now, now here's the ultimate in political hypocrisy. Smiley appoints former Councilman Bob Centelli, who was a big Smiley rubber stamp while on the council. He was also run out of office by the voters of Burton. They, he appoints him to the Burton Planning Commission. The Planning Commission deals with zoning issues and variances that may be requested by land developers. He was, uh, he was approved by Isham uh, and the council, four to three, but LeDuc again casting the deciding vote for Centelli and the, uh, being placed on the Planning Commission. Now here's the outrage with this appointment. Centelli was accused by the F a FBI informant by the name of Blake Rizzo of taking $5,000 from him as a bribe to help him rezone some property he was developing. Now here's, here's Rizzo's sworn statement before a judge in Flint and also his statements to the FBI who have been working with him frequently in the last two years since this thing came out. Here's what it says. Here's the question. This is a question by the assistant prosecutor. And then as a result of that, you were able to gain access in a way that was beneficial to yourself and your company, that is, by giving bribes. As a result of giving these gratuities to these public officials, you were able to benefit from that. Correct answer, yes. Okay, question. Now, do you know whether or not, well, let me go backward for just a second. Do you know somebody by the name of Robert Centelli? Yes, the answer is. Have you, the question is, have you done business with him? Answer, yes. Question, did you ever give him any gratuities or favors similar to that of Mr. Abbey? Answer, yes. And could you, just question, could you describe that for the record, please, before the, uh, answer, before the rezoning issue that uh, came before the city council, it was very controversial. He wanted some money to vote yes, talking about Centelli. And how much did you give him? Answer, $5,000. Question, in your mind, that was a quid pro quo? Answer, what? Quid pro, a question, quid pro quo means I give something, you give me something in exchange. Is that correct? Answer, yes. And when did that occur? Answer, well, it was on the zoning of the old Howard Farm, the 22 acres. And God, uh, that was, uh, I got that zoning on it uh, probably maybe two years ago, a year and eight months ago. Did you give him that money in cash? Cash, yes. $5,000? Answer, uh-huh. And where, the question, well, where did you give him this money? In Genesee County. And here's some more questions on it. Other than this occasion, the question is from the prosecutor, until what you believe might have been 2002, 2001, with Mr. Sintelli getting $5,000 in exchange for a favorable vote on zoning, have you had other occasions paid him a bribe? Answer, I may have given him a couple hundred dollars on his next campaign, but nothing significant. 
when he came to you and asked you to pay him $5,000, did he suggest the 5000 or did you arrive at that figure? Answer, he wanted 5000 He was playing the stock market, market pretty heavily. I knew that. He was ta take a, uh, talking to me back and forth a little bit. He was playing a little bit. And then the answer is he was losing his ass. I said I need, he said, I need $5,000. And the question is, so the picture you're painting here for me is that there are some people who have got their minds in your, uh, or their hands in your pocket, basically. Mr. McArdle is collecting, Mr. Centelli, Skeeter Abbey, and even the mayor himself. They're getting fairly large sums of money from you, correct? Yes. Now, now here's, here's the craziness about this thing. Here's the guy that has been well, they appoint a guy to this uh, planning board, Centelli, that makes the decision on zoning and variances when a land developer comes in and wants it. And he's presently being investigated for taking a bribe while a city councilman from Blake Rizzo, the FBI informant, to cast a favorable vote for a zoning request on the Howlett Farm that was owned by Rizzo. Yeah. You know, you say, where are they going with this? Don't they care what the public thinks out there? They really don't. They're arrogant. You know, it really comes down to this. If you're a de developer out there watching this program and you want a zoning variance from the Burton Planning Commission, you better bring your checkbook. You know, better yet, uh, bring cash to be sure. Remember, all of this occurred when the deciding vote on the city council to put Centelli on the planning commission came from Ralph the du Le Duke, who wasn't legally a member of the city council. Now figure that. Well, yeah, I'm sure there are good people on that planning commission that, you know, you're not going to be able to bribe, but there's one guy on there who somebody has already testified to under oath and is working with the FBI who said that they did bribe him to get him to vote for a zoning variance that he wanted. Now, the bottom line is, well, he hasn't been charged yet. He's still being investigated. I can guarantee you that. But why would you even take a chance and put him on that commission, that planning commission, when there is so much doubt about this? And what does it say to the public who have been saying, hey, we want change down there. That's why we elected anti-smiley people. But now the last two, they didn't get to vote on. Now they'll get to vote on uh, the, those two in uh, next August when they run again, if they run again, and, and Isham and all these other people on there that are the smiley people. At least three of those people you get to vote on in, in August. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind what they're doing and they're, they're unconcerned about what the the uh, voters think about it. You know, recently, the uh, people of the city or the county of Genesee approved a senior citizens millage, and it's become more and more contentious, especially since it's become clear that the county Genesee County Commission, the government body that is responsible to allocate the millage funds has no real plan for the distribution of over eight million dollars collected from the millage each year for the next ten years.
So, you know, since uh, this confusion really started with the county commission's decision to fund building a new senior citizen building in Vienna Township in northern Genesee County. There are all kinds of areas in Genesee County that don't have senior citizen centers, but there are 15 or so out there that are entitled some money here. But after much complaining by other areas in the county that do not have the senior citizen center located conveniently to their area, and since the precedent has been set, they too want a new center built for them. The precedent, they're going to build it in Vienna Township. They're going to pay for it. A million dollars or something they're going to pay over the eight-year period. A million and a half or something like that. The commission, the county commission said, we're not giving it to you, we're refusing it. You've got an equal protection problem here with these people. Goodridge Township now that's tearing down the old high school, the person who owns that says, I'm hoping that they can build a senior citizen center out here because there isn't one conveniently located to them. Why can't they have money to build a center? Their people are paying the millage, just like the people in Vienna Township. That's not equal protection of the law, if you can build one in one place and refuse the other. Obviously, the agreeing to build the Vienna Township senior citizen, in my mind, was bad public policy. As I say, there are 15 or 16 other senior citizens that have their hands out for some of the money, and rightfully so, because their constituents have voted for the, for the near $80 million millage. And they'd be paying the bill. Here's a, an interesting article by one of our favorite reporters with the journal, Ron Fonger. He always seems to get these stories. Uh, you know, he's constantly on the lookout. That's why you... We quote him a lot. Senior Citizens Center awaits new tax dollar. And here's what it says, some of the things it says. Commissioners agreed Wednesday. This was uh, February 1st, so it would be the end of January. Agreed Wednesday to a conceptual plan aimed at sending each of the county's 15 full-time centers cash grants that would be used with few restrictions. Hey, look, we got all this money. Let's uh, raise the uh, uh, the director's salary by 50%. Let's uh, hire some aunts and uncles of some of the people. We got the money. No restrictions, or few as they say. Special contracts with each center would be based at least in part on the number of seniors served by each center and probably would amount to no more than $200,000 each, about $3 million total, one senior citizen director said. And then it goes on to say, County Corporation Council Ward Chapman said that the grants being discussed would not restrict centers in how the money is spent. <laughs> how can you justify giving taxpayers' money away to people who aren't elected, who aren't you have no control over? How can you? How can you justify giving them money to use any way they want? That's what Chapman says. But anyway, it says here, the like, I like the idea of base grants. Some of these centers are hanging on their fingernails, said Chairman Archie Bailey. Now, I, I don't often agree with Woodrow Stanley, but I have to agree with him on this. He's quoted in this article saying, Woodrow Stanley, Democrat Flint, said the county might uh, want to consider the number of senior citizens in each municipality. 
not just how many currently visit the center as contracts with centers are drafted. <coughs> so it, it, it makes sense. Apparently, the dis, uh, disbursement formula haven't even really been worked out to any degree yet. So the anticipated method of distribution will be, as indicated here, kind of prorated. Just give them the money. And how much each program is spending and how many citizens they're serving. You know, little consideration is given to what the potential of a center is or how many more people it could serve if it had the money. It appears that the formula rewards the centers operating in communities that can afford generous contributions to the center for operational purposes. And the communities that are spending the least on their centers because of their limited resources will get less. It seems this approach defeats the whole purpose of the senior citizen millage concept, right? Provide funding to the centers that need it most to equalize the services that all the senior citizens need wherever they live. This formula of pro rata funding of the centers that need it most. Now if it's adopted, it will accelerate the disparity by the millage that was supposed to be an equalizer. For example, Suppose, like they said, they're not going to give anybody more than $200,000. Because, uh, you know, it would seem to me that would mean if you have a center that's spending $300,000 and you, you set the pro rata up on the basis of 10% or 20% or 25%, the center spending the most money having a greater contribution from a more wealthy community would be given a higher percentage prorated of the money. Let's, appear, let's suppose it's 25%. They'd be getting $75,000 in, in a center that uses $300,000 to operate and the other one who can only afford $200,000 to operate would be getting 50000 So the rich are getting richer and the poor are the poorer. Now this, this policy, this concept that we're talking about hasn't really been discussed publicly. It was discussed behind closed doors. And it really boils down again to the wealthy centers would get more money from the millage than the poor centers if this formula is contemplated, that is contemplated, doles out the money on a prorated basis like I say. Now, the community that will get screwed on this deal will be the city of Flint. They said, we're not going to give more than $200,000. Their taxpayers are paying, the city of Flint taxpayers are paying $1,200,000 each year towards the millage, and they said they're only going to give them $200,000 back of the near $8 million they collect each year. A million two hundred thousand from the city taxpayers. Where's that money going? To other senior citizen centers out in the county? Keep in mind, many of the city's locations used for senior citizens programs are presently shut down because of lack of funds in the city like Broome Park, for example, in the South End. So nothing would be set aside for these buildings because there's no cost to prorate. Some other city programs are operating on a shoestring, like Haskell. 
So the proration would be figured on a smaller cost caused by the understaffing and the fewer programs. As you can see, these programs are the ones that need the most help to better service the seniors in their area. You know, as it turns out, if the formula is put in effect, the city of Flint will suffer more than the wealthy, wealthy communities. Now, the, the, now, you've heard me talk about institutional racism. That's a racism that's built into the system. Not necessarily that the people who are benefiting by this institutional racism are racist, but the system provides this. And, that, and setting this kind of a prorated amount of money to be given to every center and not giving more than $200,000 really is institutional racism. It runs throughout this concept. The poor community like Flint will fall, fall further and further behind, resulting in fewer and fewer facilities and programs for the senior citizens, mostly African American in the city of Flint. That's how it impacts. Each year, the proration will be on the bottom line for the sinners that are able to remain. Each year, they'll be getting more and more money. But if they can't continue to operate, less and less money will be flowing in because the sinners are not, don't have a bottom line. And here's a, here's a situation where you're going to give $200,000 to Flint, maximum, $200,000 maybe to Flushing, maximum, $200,000 to other communities, maximum. Flint provides more money for this marriage than any other community. Million two hundred thousand dollars and you're only going to give them two hundred? That's crazy, especially when their senior centers, senior uh, citizen centers are collapsing all around the city because they don't have the money. I think they should get more money. And to set that figure at 200000 is unfair to them. The result is, in Flint, the less and less money they receive, they will have fewer and fewer participants, and more and more senior citizens will be left out. Well, we, I'm going to have to get to the uh, speed trap next week and a few other subjects we weren't able to get to, but uh, we will see you next week. We'll have more on these subjects. And the Senior Citizens Program has a big meeting Friday at the uh, uh, Genesee County Administration Building in the cha uh, Council ch uh, Commission Chambers. You ought to be there if you're interested. But in the meantime... We'll see you next week, and we'll be at the White Horse.